So, my name is Nina O'Hare. I'm a Community Project Officer for Worcestershire Archive and Archaeology Service. So, we're part of the County Council, and Small Pits Big Ideas, which the World Video was part of, um, is a project that I've been running. So, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about the project as a whole, just for those of you who haven't heard about it already. And then I'm going to go through what we found in all of the World Video's test kits before having a look at what, uh, what information and what answers we can start to see when we put all of that together. If anyone didn't see the finds display as you came in, that will still be there afterwards. You're welcome to stay and have a good nosy at that later on. So if you haven't seen it, you've not missed that opportunity. So Small Pits, Big Ideas, uh, this one's name number two, we did have a pilot project. And it's been a community archaeology project investigating rural medieval settlements across Worcestershire. So it's been as much about research and finding out about the past as it has been about getting people involved. The project has visited six locations around Worcestershire. Uh, we tried to spread them out around the county. I know the map's a little bit small to see, um, but all the blue dots are locations that we've been digging. The Big Dig Weekends took place from uh, autumn 2021 until last summer. So Wolverley's Dig was towards the end uh, of the Big Digs that we held. The project is coming towards the end now. So it officially ends at the end of March. So at the moment we've got lots of final talks and touring exhibition that's going on. The project has really been about understanding the story of our villages. So what we're really wanting to look at are villages that we know have some medieval, some early origins, but that we still live in today. So archaeologists have been very good at looking at deserted villages, because they're really nice and easy to dig up. There's no buildings, no houses there, you can dig a bigger trench as you want, um, and it's all quite nice and easy. Somebody sensibly pointed out though a while ago, that the story of our deserted sites might not be the same as villages that people carried on living in and are still living in today. The deserted sites are deserted for a reason. Um, so it seems sensible to have a look at the villages we still live in today. We know across England as a whole that the general thought is that villages start to appear between the 10th and the 12th century, so the really early medieval period. That's England as a whole though, and we don't know if that's the picture in Worcestershire. If that is the case in Worcestershire, uh, what happens during the Black Death, which happened in the 1340s, um, we know that a lot of population died from the plague, and what impact did that have? And just a bit more about what was going on here. Uh, it's interesting to know about other parts of the country, but what about Worcestershire and the West Midlands? So the way to have a look at the villages we still live in are through test pits. So these are just one by one metre square, they're really small and they can fit into most gardens and green spaces in a village. They're really helpful because you don't need to open up a massive area, which obviously when there's lots of houses and lots of people living there, it's not very easy to do. <laughs> so can we just look under your house please? <laughs> The idea that they work on is actually you don't need to see a medieval building to know that there, there was one there in the past. Because if you can find all their rubbish, all the medieval pottery and other bits and pieces that they threw away, you know that those people were someone living really nearby. And this is all based on the fact that no one came and collected your rubbish in the past. So today, if you put your wheelie bins out, the council can take your rubbish away once a week, once a fortnight. No one did that in the past, and rubbish tended to go as far away as people were prepared to walk to throw it. It's often it's not, probably not very far, <laughs> so the nearest rubbish heap, the nearest ditch, just far enough away that you're not going to smell it, perhaps, but not much further. So it means if we find uh, rubbish that people have left behind, we know that we're quite near to where people are actually living. The project has been looking at pottery in particular because pottery is really easy to date. As fashions and styles change, pottery changed. So because it changes quite often, it's much easier to date 
than things that are purely functional, things like roof tiles and nails that always look the same for centuries because no one's bothered, you know, bothered about how they look. Test bits give you a good idea of the history of an individual house plot, and then when you put that together across the whole village, you can start to see the story of that village. If you take another step back and you do test between across the whole region, you can start to see an even bigger story about what was going on. So test sitting has been pretty extensively done over in East Anglia by Professor Karenza Lewis. So if any of you have watched lots of Time Team, you may recognise the name from there. They've, uh, over a period of about 10 or so years, they've been to lots and lots of villages in East Anglia. And it started to show quite a striking picture of the Black Death and the impact that had on East Anglia's villages. That's a really interesting story. What would be nice to know is, is the story of Worcestershire and the West Midlands, is that the same? Or have we got something different going on to what we see in East Anglia? So on to Horbally itself. I'm not going to give an extensive history of the village, but I just want to highlight a few key things we know about its early history. So the first thing to mention is that Wolverley uh, is first mentioned in written records from the 9th century. So it's been around for a long time. At the time of the Norman Conquest, which was in 1066, it was quite a sizable settlement. So it's still, still sort of village rural settlement size, um, but it was recorded in the Doomsday Survey, which was taken in 1086. It's recorded as being 17 households, and that included a priest, so it's presumably a church there, and a mill. So this is, this is quite substantial. 17 households sounds quite small to us now, um, but it's, it's quite an average size medieval village is. What these documents don't tell us is where that village was located and what it looked like. So that's what we really wanted to find out from the test pits. <coughs> So last June we had a big dig weekend and we excavated 15 test pits across the village and 81 people came and took part um, during that weekend, so lots of people got involved. <coughs> the majority of the test pits we excavated reached the bottom of the archaeological sequence, which is really, really important for, for us and the, the story we can tell from what we found. So archaeology doesn't go on forever in the ground. There's a point at which the soil stops being disturbed by humans and containing human artefacts, and it starts being undisturbed geology. That's something that archaeologists call natural. It's just kind of the natural, undisturbed ground. We quite often get asked, what point is that? How deep will it be? It's different everywhere. It depends how much people have been on that site, what they've been doing there, they've been dumping loads of rubbish and the ground's built up a lot, or has that not been the case and actually it's quite shallow. <coughs> Across a lot of Wolverley, the natural ground has reached between 50 and 60 centimetres down. So just to give you an idea, that's how deep most of the test pits went. So this is a map of Wolverley. All the red dots are where we had a test pit. So as you can see, they're quite nicely spread out. We did concentrate on what seems to be the older part of the village. So um, down past the church, and along the brook, and then going up um, Lake to Lane. We didn't look at the area to the North Fairfield um, Lane side. We know that's quite a uh, modern development of the village. And it was all built in the 20th century mostly. So we started looking uh, yeah, what we thought we might find some of the older parts of the village. So I'm going to run through the test pits now, one by one. I'm going to start up at the north and work, work our way down throughout the village. So test pit one was up at Woodfield Farm, Woodfield, Wood, Woodfield Barn Garden. Um, so this is just past the secondary school in the York Hill. Woodfield Barn, uh, as the name suggests, is a converted agricultural building um, and this is the test pit and way in the back garden. 
So Woodfield Farm was built at some point in the middle of the 20th century. It's not there um, on the tide map, which was made in 1838, but it is there by the time of the Ordnance Survey in 1883, so it's built at some point between those two. <clears throat> Interestingly, we had a lot of metalworking waste from this test pit. Uh, as I'm sure some of you I know who helped that test pit here tonight, I'm sure you remember. So the metalworking waste looks a lot like the picture on the right hand side. It's not the most glamorous thing. Uh, it is quite, uh, it's quite, it can be quite heavy. Um, sometimes it can be quite light, a bit of a mixture, but it can be a bit grotty, a bit like rusted metal. Sometimes it has some metallic bits in it. You do find uh, some of this metalworking waste. Sometimes you get it dumped on sites where they've used it as hardcore and hard standing. This doesn't seem to be the case over here, interestingly, because we have such a lot of the waste, but we also have some half bricks, which is starting to suggest that actually there was a forge potentially on the farm, or certainly very near to it. And that's not something that's recorded on any historic mapping, um, but that uh, does maybe it is. Um, it's where they built for the walled garden. It was on the corner of the city. Yes, there is one further down, but I don't know whether the farm itself, it's yeah. possible there was one on the farm itself mm -hmm. as well. And so it'd be interesting to find out a bit more of that ties up with, with any of the known history. Interesting as well, we didn't have any finds that predated the 18th century, which on the face of it I know seems quite disappointing, because it's always exciting <laughs> to have earlier finds. What is interesting though is that it tells us that Woodfield Farm is the first time the buildings have been on that site. There have been suggestions that medieval occupation um, was up in that area around Woodfield Farm. In fact, we didn't find any medieval pottery, anything <coughs> other than the farm, tells us fairly definitively that, that that probably isn't the case. Test pit two, uh, a little bit further down the road, um, at the Walled Garden. So, the name suggests the Walled Garden was originally built as part of the landscaped gardens around Wormley House, just, just a little bit further to the south. Built probably in the 18th century, as part of their gardens. And interestingly, on the, um, the 1883 survey map, uh, there is, in the top corner, there's a smithy marked on there. So the test, test bit two was actually located not within the walled garden, but it's up in the northern corner, but near to where that smithy is shown on the map. I should say that building is not still standing today, so that's no longer around. We did again here find evidence of uh, quite a lot of metalworking waste. Um, interestingly, uh, a little bit possibly of uh, metal production as well. So you get two kinds of metalworking waste. Most of what we see is from metal being shaped and being made into items that people want to use. But you do get waste as well from taking the raw ore and turning it into the metal in the first place. Um, so there's hints that actually there may have been uh, a forge of actually making metal somewhere near to this site. There's not quite enough to say that definitively. It might just be that they're in contact with, with a sort of um, furnace that was actually producing metal. But it might be that that smithy wasn't just. Uh, shaping metal and working with it, it was perhaps producing it too. Quite excitingly though, we had a very, very early find from this test pit, um, which is on the, on the table at the back, um, which is this prehistoric work flint, so it's one on the left here. This is actually quite a small piece, it's just a couple of centimetres across. It's, it's quite hard to precisely date, but um, comes from either the Neolithic or the Bronze Age. So that has quite a wide time range to it, but it's probably made between 4,000 and about 800 BC, so thousands of years ago. It's not been made as a specific tool. This is something that um, has come off as like a waste flake from someone napping flint. Someone's then picked it up and thought, oh, that probably could be useful, and they made one edge slightly serrated. And they've probably used it for a very specific job and then thrown it away again. So it has been used as a tool, but it wasn't sort of 
uh, set out, no one set out to make this into a particular shape of object. So this could be, or it could be um, a set of prehistoric settlement around Wolverley. What's probably more likely with this though is that it's people passing through the area and stopping, um, napping a bit of flint, using some tools and then moving on. And that's quite common to see across the country that you, you find the odd flint here and there from people passing through. Interestingly, from Tesco 2, we had quite an early handmade brick. So there isn't a photograph of this on the slide. I'm sure you can all probably imagine what brick looks like. This one, if you haven't seen it, the back is quite thin. It's about two inches high. And it's really early. <coughs> so it comes, uh, those bricks of that size were typically made in the late 15th and 16th century. Um, they are usually used to build brick chimneys. That date, brick buildings are not very common. And it's quite unusual to find bricks like this in rural areas. So it's becoming more common in towns and estates. Um, so it's quite an intriguing thing to find in Wolverley. <laughs> and what it does suggest is actually there's perhaps quite, quite a well-off building somewhere near this site. <coughs> and, and one that certainly predates Wolverley House. So, um, it's probably more likely that the brick comes from sort of the end of its date range, and um, so sort of the 16th, maybe the early 17th century. Um, but that's, that's still quite an interesting find, not something we would necessarily expect to see in a village. The last thing I just want to point out is um, this piece of pottery on the right. <coughs> um, and it's quite hard to see. Um, you can see it in person at the back, um, but it has a fingerprint on it. So I just wanted to highlight this because not all finds are part of a bigger, grander story, but some of them are just very personal connections to someone hundreds or thousands of years ago. Um, that was a real person who made that pot, <laughs> and their fingerprint left the mark. Uh, it's probably um, around the 18th century that was made, so it's a couple of hundred years old. Um, I just wonder who they were and whether they would expect so many people to be looking, <laughs> looking at their fingerprints today. So, test bit three and test bit five were both in the gardens of the birches. Um, we had two test bits there. Um, this first one turned out to be quite shallow. Um, the land, the area had probably been uh, truncated a little bit from building work, so we had a second test bit in the garden. There too. So the, the house there is thought to be uh, uh, late 18th or early 19th century. There are indications inside though um, that it might be earlier and for speaking to the current owners, it sounds like the house might be a little bit earlier than it, than it looks from the outside. So across these two test bits, we found three pieces of medieval pottery. This is the first signs we've got of medieval warbly, which is quite exciting. Three pieces doesn't sound like very much. They might not look like very much, they are quite small pieces, but it does tell us that there were houses in the medieval period somewhere quite near to this site. <coughs> What we also had from this test bit, which again is quite uh, interesting to see, is that there was some quite early roof tile. So the roof tile is medieval, uh, it's from centuries just after, probably somewhere between the 15th and the 17th century. But at this date, a lot of buildings were still thatched. In towns, you start to see quite a lot of tile, uh, buildings with tiled roofs. Particularly in Worcester, they started to make it mandatory to have a tiled roof because they kept having lots of fires. But in rural areas, you see a lot of thatched buildings still. So, this is probably, again, quite a fairly well off building uh, to have had a tiled roof at this stage. The majority of the finds from these test pits uh, were then from the 18th century onwards, which fits in with 
uh, the current version of the house as we see it today. But those earlier finds do start to suggest that actually the house is perhaps on the plot of an earlier building, or perhaps there might be some earlier elements of a, of a previous building inside it still. So I think there's probably a bit more going on there than appears to the eye. <coughs> Test pit four was over the road in the garden of Walbury House. You can just see Walbury House in the background there. Um, Test pit was in the garden of West Wing, which was actually built uh, in the 1940s, so it's more recent than the main house, which is Georgian. Uh, I think they were originally built um, when it was being used as a school, um, so it's a different condition. So the first thing to say about test bit 4 is that there were fewer finds than we might expect from a test bit that is right next to a very large 18th century house. Kind of expect that they're going to be throwing away loads of rubbish and we expect to find lots of things. On the other hand, it might be too surprising that we didn't find that much because we were in front of the house and actually we know that the gardens were landscaped around the house and actually it's probably quite unlikely that they had their rubbish heap out the front. I'm sure it's probably around the back by some outbuildings way out of sight of all the visitors and the residents. So perhaps maybe not so surprising that we didn't find too much. What we did find though was quite interesting. But again, we had a piece of medieval pottery, a bit of a cooking pot, and so it looks like this image um, on the left here. It's a quite straight sided, fairly flat bottoms. Uh, this is the actual piece. Um, I know they look quite grassy. <laughs> medieval pots can, can go quite stone like, particularly when it's being rolled around in the ground. But again, it starts to tell us that in this area there are some medieval buildings somewhere nearby. And interestingly, we did have a few finds that probably from the 16th, 17th, 17th century onwards, and those are earlier than the current Morley House. So it's looking like there's, there are some buildings, some buildings in that area before, before the buildings we see today. So on to test bit five, which is at Rock Hill. So this is at the junction of um, Lakeshore Lane and Draco Lane. The house, um, as you see it today, uh, is thought to be 18th century. And it does have a date place on the side um, that reads Isaiah Talbot, I think 1769. I know though that there are some timber framing inside and it does seem to be an earlier building. So whether the date plate is from some sort of remodeling of the house and um, sort of uh, extensions or kind of a revamp of it, and um, that perhaps is quite likely. So Tesco 5 was in the back garden, quite close to the house, which we thought would be quite a good place to be, and that turned out to be exactly the case. So this test pit had quite a deep build-up of archaeological layers, and they contained a lot of medieval pottery. This, I think, is the only test pit where we had undisturbed medieval layers. And an awful lot of pottery, which is quite exciting to find. So the majority of what we of the medieval pottery dates from the 13th century, and probably a lot of it is cooking pots. So again, like that picture on the right hand side. A lot of the medieval pottery that we find is cooking pots. Because the ceramic pots, when you keep putting them over a fire, you heat them and then you cool them again and you heat them up, they break quite easily. So it wasn't necessary that people owned loads of cooking pots, they just broke quite a lot. Um, and therefore people had to keep replacing them. What we did also find though, alongside quite a lot of cooking pots, are some <coughs> medieval roof tiles. So these are earlier than the ones that we saw at the Birches, at Chess Pits 3 and 15. Those were sort of 17th, uh, 15th and 17th century. These ones are much earlier. These were probably made between the 13th and the 16th century. At this stage, it really is quite unusual to have entire buildings in a rural area. One of the bits that we have as well is plains, um, it's a ridge tile. So that's a green piece in the bottom right hand corner. 
This would have looked like quite a fancy building. <laughs> this building probably had quite a shiny green ridge on the roof <coughs> uh, and would have looked quite impressive. So this is signs not just that there was medieval settlements on this spot, but actually that it was quite a substantial building as well. Just to show you a little bit, this is um, some of the medieval pottery just found in one layer. So this is all found 30 to 40 centimetres down. It's not all of the medieval pottery. Um, but there are quite uh, two here and the top right. There's two nice big pieces of cooking pot rooms. Pot rooms are always really helpful to archaeologists because you can see how big the original pot was and what shape it was. And that gives you a much better date than one of these little tiny pieces down here that have been rolled around us. Oh, and just before, so I just thought I'd move on more with that one. Just wanted to say that uh, Rock Hill uh, House, obviously there is still a house on that pot today. It's probably quite unlikely that the original building we see today has been there for the last 800 years. Um, but what it does suggest is that people have actually been living on that site for all that time. Uh, even the current house is perhaps a little bit later than that in dates. Um, I think that's quite a remarkable thing uh, to realise actually that people have been living in the same place, probably calling the same spot home for such a long time. Um, it's just kind of a continuity we don't always think about, I think, such a long time. Test bit six was next door, back from my house. Um, just slightly further down the road building. This test bit again was in the back garden. The house is partly from the frames. It's thought to be early 17th century with some uh, 19th century additions. Again, the timber frame buildings, uh, it's always a bit hard to know whether there's perhaps some earlier parts hidden away in there. What we found here were an awful lot of finds. I had a considerable number of finds in this test bit, and lots of them are from the 18th century onwards. So, lots of them do date from the house that we can see today. What we did get though was a range of medieval pottery as well. So, we didn't find anywhere near as much as we had at test bit 5, but there was still quite a bit of medieval pottery, including some quite nice pieces. So this slightly grotty, I know on the side looking bit, originally had a green glaze on it and um, was part of a jug that looked like a picture and it's had a uh, stamped decoration around it as well, so it's been a kind of a fancy jug. Very intriguingly we've got the bottom right, this little stone looking bit, and it's actually a little bit of very early window glass. You can't see through it now. I have tried holding onto the light. I have no idea how our fine archaeologists spotted this. <laughs> I would never have recognised it. Um, but it's something called forest glass, um, which is only made before the 18th century. Uh, it's from a window pane. It probably could well be quite a bit earlier than the 18th century, but it's quite hard to date uh, before that time uh, because people made glass in the same way for quite a long time. That's really again quite an interesting find. Window glass is really expensive <laughs> at that time. And again, we're starting to see that actually there's some quite fancy buildings in this part of Fort Billy, um, some quite early ones as well. Um, and the last thing I just want to point out here is about this lovely, uh, we had part of a lovely little cup like this. So, so this is not, we didn't find a hole with them, I'm afraid, but we have got the handle. Um, of a nice little cup, which is a little bit later in date, probably more like the 18th century, um, but has quite sweet little handles. So, quite an interesting selection of finds, and also quite a mysterious find. I just wanted to show you, um, this is something that uh, is a little bit of a mystery in some ways, and just goes to show that archaeologists haven't seen everything. There is a lot more out there still to find out about the past. So this is two bits of pottery that join together. 
and you have found 30 centimetres apart in the ground. So one was 30 centimetres down and one was 60 centimetres down. So this is a garden that someone has really well worked over at some point. It's a really unusual type of pot that we haven't seen before. It looks a little bit like pottery they make around the Malvern area, almost to show, um, in the 15th, the early 17th century. But the clay doesn't look quite like the clay you get from the potters who are in the Malvern area. And it's just a really weird shape. <laughs> We've not seen one like this before. It was probably quite a round sort of pot shape. It's got inside, it's got um, sort of a raised sort of rim inside, probably to put a lid on. It's glazed inside the bottom, and then on the outside, it's got this little lug handle, and you might have had one on the other side as well, carry. This is just a shape that we've just never really seen before. We think it probably comes from quite a local potter. So it seems that in the Wolverley area, there probably were some medieval potters uh, operating and uh, making pottery uh, quite locally to the area. So pottery we've seen so far uh, from the test bits has come from quite a wide range of, of sources. Medieval pottery uh, from Test 5 came from Worcester, Worcester area, the Melbourne area, some from Staffordshire and some from Shropshire. So they're clearly accessing markets uh, or they're being brought where it's quite a long way away. Um, but there is some slightly unusual stuff that seems to be made quite locally, mm -hmm. which is not something we, that, that's kind of really known about before. Is, is that a salt that you see there? I'm not sure, I don't think so. Um, I'm afraid to be to the um, fine specialists. The fine specialists will know, but I don't think it is. Um, I can always find out here if you want. Um, test pit 7 uh, is a little bit further down the slope. Um, this is at Frogmore Cottage. So down to Frogmore Cottage uh, is just in the background of the photograph. It's, uh, it's on the tide map of 1838, so should be built before that date. It's, it's recorded as originally being, or at some time in its history, being a rectory, and was possibly part of land that originally belonged to Frogmore House. The garden is really quite sloped there, and been terraced as well, so we can put a test bit too near the house, um, but we're still kind of fairly close, um, as you can see in the picture. <laughs> Interestingly, from Test Pit 7, we did have shards of medieval pottery, potentially slightly later medieval pottery, but only one shirt. So this is telling us that we are still quite near to medieval occupation, but not right on top of it. And what this is starting to look like, actually, is that there's a concentration of medieval settlements sort of on the brow of the slope as you go up. But probably not coming down the slope. So the sort of row layout we see um, on the sort of Victorian maps, all the houses kind of being laid out along the road, that probably is a later development rather than how the original medieval village looked. The majority of finds we've had from Test 7 are from the late 18th or the early 19th century, so they kind of fit in with the date of the house and the standing there today. A couple of particularly nice ones that we've had are the top of the glass bottle. Um, so when you start getting slightly earlier glass, um, it starts getting a slightly metallic sheen on it. That's because the way the, the glass was made, uh, it uh, starts to kind of effectively decay in the ground. So the glass we make today wouldn't be this in the ground, but that's uh, up to sort of the Victorian era. And start going slightly metallic -y the longer it is in the ground. There's also a piece of up here um, of something called a pension, um, which are made in the 17th and 18th centuries. They are very large bowls, so they're usually used for making bread or separating cream, uh, generally mixing things. Um, that's quite a, a nice time. <coughs> Was it someone who really enjoyed cooking or someone who really resented being in the kitchen? <laughs> <laughs>
Test for eight, moving in the road and up to the garden of the hay So this, uh, as the name suggests, was an agricultural building that seemed to invest to a house. It's originally part of Wolverley House to the state, so it was one of the outbuildings at Wolverley House. Uh, as you can see. And the test pit uh, within the garden, which slopes quite steeply away and ultimately heads down towards the river. Test is partly so deep because we're on quite a steep slope, and the soil kind of tends to accumulate and kind of shift downhill over time. This test pit, the ground there, had been really disturbed, um, and I know there's been quite a lot of building work in an area adjacent. And we did find bits of modern computer circuit board, <laughs> um, kind of jumbled up with lots of other things. Amongst that though, we did have a little bit of prehistoric worked flint, so it's definitely things thousands of years older going on. <coughs> and interestingly, we had a few finds that are potentially 16th or 17th century, so things that predate Wolverley House itself. So, um, this bottom, uh, bottom left one here is something called Midlands Yellow Wear, and, and that's probably the earliest one on that slide. It, it's quite often 16th century in date. This is quite interesting to see because we don't have any medieval uh, evidence from this test pit, but we do have something slightly earlier than Wolverley House. And actually, this area is quite close to where we know there was a tithe farm. The tithe farm burnt down in the 1930s, so there are some photographs of it. And it seems to be a late medieval tithe farm. And it's probably near some other houses. Um, tithe barns aren't usually built out on a limb, you know, somewhere on their own. They are usually next to other buildings. And that's perhaps where some of these earlier finds are coming from, actually. Perhaps there are a few other buildings around the tithe farm. Test bit nine is getting right at the bottom of the slope down by the brook at Willow Cottage. So, cottage, uh, possibly 16th century uh, in origin, parts in the frame. Uh, it's quite early, uh, with its sort of 20th century strip extension. And so, um, but because of that building work, we thought the ground might seem quite disturbed around the house. So, the test that we had was a little bit further away towards the brook. So, interestingly, again, here with this test bit, we had some quite early roof tiles. So, not medieval, but they are from the centuries a little bit after, so from the 15th, 16th, maybe the early 17th century. They're the same as we saw up at the Birches at test bits 3 and 15. <coughs> These fit quite nicely with the date of the timber frame cottage. And probably, <coughs> but again, it's kind of unusual to see roof tiles of this date. We would expect that cottages of that date in a village would more likely be thatched than, than tiled. So, a quite interesting one to see. The ground here seems to have been quite heavily turned up, and um, possibly it's quite near to the brook as well, so that's quite possibly flooded and will kind of disturb things over time. What that did mean though is, although we didn't quite get to the bottom of this test, but we didn't find the undisturbed geology, I do think that if there was lots of medieval pottery to be found here, <coughs> we probably would have seen it, because with the ground being so turned up, and the likelihood is that it was there to be found, and some would have been a bit nearer the surface. What we did find though were some quite nice, uh, sort of slightly more personal things from the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, including a simple porcelain figurine. Um, so I don't think you can just make out that there's a face at the bottom with quite a big brim hat. Um, and so that probably wants, perhaps wants to do in the cottage at some point. For test bit 10, we were heading over the road to um, the old schoolhouse. So this is built uh, in the early 19th century as part of a range of buildings. 
And unsurprisingly, given the name, originally built with school buildings. <coughs> this test pit was in the back garden and was really, really deep. <laughs> so we didn't get to the bottom of this test pit uh, just because it was so deep. Um, Cookie guys uh, who were excavating someone did had uh, it was a really sterling job, and he did get down to one metre, which is quite an impressive feat in two days. Uh, but it just seems that there has been a lot of probably Victorian as well, rubbish dumped in this area, which is great to see. We got had loads of fines, but did mean that we didn't get quite to the bottom. There are some quite intriguing finds in this test bit. So, the majority of them were from the late 17th to the 19th centuries. So, some are a little bit earlier than the school buildings. Um, and they do suggest that actually there were some houses in that area, probably in the 17th and 18th centuries. Interestingly, though, we had this strange object <laughs> up at the top, um, which we think is probably a wig or a hair. So this is a really bizarre phenomenon and something I've never thought about before, <laughs> before seeing this. But in the Georgian era, if you were anybody important, having curly hair and very elaborate hairstyles was the thing to do. And they, because the hairstyles got so elaborate, they also started using wigs. And if you want to have curly wigs or you want to curl your hair, you need something to do it with. Um, so <laughs> there were wig curlers. They're made out of the same material as clay pipes. Um, and when they were whole, they looked like these ones at the bottom. So the one that we found is a slightly unusual shape. It's not quite as smooth, um, but there doesn't seem to be anything else that, uh, that fits uh, quite so nicely with what this is. This is a very intriguing thing to find because wood colours are not something you're going to find in the house of sort of an ordinary farm worker and sort of just an ordinary family. And not the sort of people who are going to be owning wigs or curling their hair. But it is the sort of thing you would expect to find somewhere like Wolfley House. And some of the, the larger houses in the village that actually perhaps linked to sort of industrial expansion, what we saw when the canal arrived and some of the mills uh, so expanded. Actually, some of those residences, perhaps where this is coming from. There is a possibility in this testament that we missed some of the earlier archaeology. And it was also quite well mixed up again, so the Victorian finds down for one week down. Um, but because it was so deep, it is possible that there's lots of Victorian dumping and um, all that rubbish that went there, and that there is an older layer underneath. I think it's probably less likely here. Um, we've missed kind of lots of exciting medieval or early finds, uh, but it is possible. We can't say the death that there wasn't any. <coughs> so moving south of the church now. Uh, moving on to Panshop Cottage, uh, which is blue triangle right at the bottom. So this test pit was on land belonging to Panshop Cottage, which is which was built in the 20th century, but it joins the original Panshop Cottage, which is much earlier, and is now known as Rose Cottage. Um, so this was in an area near near an old building. Finds we had here were typical of sort of household rubbish from the late 18th and 19th centuries. Um, so an interesting mix mix of things, including some nice bottle stocks. So a nice glass one down at the bottom, um, and one at the top, which says um, the Bath Row Bottling Company Limited, Birmingham. Anyone knows anything about the Bath Row Bottling Company? I'd be interested to hear afterwards. Um, we have been able to find out huge amounts about them. Uh, but I think we had one from Pest uh either in Wiley, Glass, or in Bailey, so we seem to have got around <laughs> at the time. Um, yeah, perhaps quite popular. We did find Pest and some porcelain as well, um, which we haven't seen very much of in Wolverley, 
Um, we have seen a bit more in some of the other villages where we've had big digs. I think this is perhaps just showing that Wolverley is a little bit further from Worcester Horseman Works and perhaps some of the villages a bit nearer to Worcester could get cheap seconds or just get hold of the horse in a little bit more easily than Wolverley. <laughs> What this test pit did do is confirm that this area was farmland until there were a few houses built there uh, from the 18th century onwards. So what it's telling us is actually there doesn't seem to be medieval occupation in this, this part of the village. Test pit 12 was pretty much just next door. Um, So this is Rose Cottage, which was historically known as Handshop Cottage. And it's timber framed inside and it's thought to have been built in the 17th century as commercial premises. So uh, presumably for making hands, given the name. Uh, it was in the 18th century, it was converted into houses, originally two tiny little cottages and then combined into one. had quite a lot of finds from this test pit, the um, majority of which date from the late 18th century onwards. So that really does fit with the, uh, that building becoming houses. We don't seem to have many finds from it being an industrial premises. <coughs> there are some uh, pretty nice and some quite unusual finds as well. So we had uh, the third bit of prehistoric work to bench from here which is always nice to find. There's some quite decorative pottery. We had some marbles, uh, probably a small bowl or a cup, and um, may have looked a little bit like the one in the bottom corner. Um, I always think it's surprising how modern some of these designs can look, yet how old they are. This was made probably between 1770 and 1820. So it's a good few hundred years old. <coughs> uh, it doesn't look that out of place, or certainly not during the early 20th century, it wouldn't look that out of place. We had a lot of clay pipes in this test set, and we also had a complete uh, clay pipe bowl, which is quite unusual to find, because they usually get crushed, you usually just get the stem of the pipe. And um, this is slightly earlier one as well, it's from the 18th century, so it's not Victorian. And then up at the top here, we have our really kind of unusual mystery find. <coughs> this is the toe bone of a horse. First thing to say, if you've never seen a to horse toe bone, they are quite large. <laughs> they sit just above the hoof. So they still have kind of toe bones, even though you don't see them. You know, they have hooves rather than separate toes, I guess. It's had a hole drilled into it though, at the top. So up here. There's a hole drilled all the way through that comes out the bottom. We have no idea why, <laughs> why someone would do this. We asked our animal bone specialist and she said that this is something you see, so it's not unique, but nobody has any idea why you would do this. There's lots of suggestions. If anyone has ideas, you're welcome to suggest them at the end. I'd just love to know though, because someone really wants quite a bit of effort. <coughs> Test bit 13 was over at Wolverley Court, <coughs> so we're moving a little bit further east now. So Wolverley Court is now a Nightingale uh, residential home. It's thought though that the building uh, was constructed for the Atwood family around 1600. So uh, it's, from the core of it is quite old um, and it had quite extensive work done in the 19th century. Test it there, which is at the back, produced our only Roman find uh, from Wilberley. Um, it's a little bit of pottery, it has been quite rolled around, um, but it does suggest there was some Roman presence in the area. Um, probably a little bit of a way over though, um, but it may come from something looking a bit like this. It's a type of pottery called Seven Valley Ware that, that's made to the Northwestern area. What we did find as well is some signs of medieval activity. So we have this nice little bit of medieval pottery, 
which I think from memory came up at the very end of Sunday, at the last day of the day. <coughs> and it was quite interesting, quite exciting to find because it was the first confirmation of something that's definitely ready for here. So again, it's from a cooking pot, a bit like the picture in the middle. <coughs> We also had um, a little bit oh, inside, and a little bit of roof tile from here as well. So there's definitely some buildings going on in this area. And intriguingly, uh, we had a bit possibly from a uh, metal working path and to a half brick. So there seems to be quite a lot going on on this site over time. And last but by no means least, test bit 14 was that wire mill cottage. So, Wire Mill Cottage is um, a bit on the right hand side of the photograph. The, the mill itself was founded around 1669, and, and whilst the industrial buildings aren't around today, um, the core of Wire Mill Cottage, and the kind of middle section, is thought to date from around that time. <coughs> So this test book produced quite a lot of roof tiles, um, which were not modern. So these are broadly dated from the 16th to the 18th century, and um, probably come from the mill itself. So they could be slightly earlier than the mill, but I think the most likely explanation is that these are a lot of tiles from all the mill buildings. The earliest pottery we found here is from the late 18th century. So actually, the first time people seem to be living on this site is the 18th century. Despite the fact that the mill there earlier, they seem to see too many signs of it. Interestingly, at the bottom of the test bit, we had a cobbled surface, <coughs> which seems to be in the yard, or possibly with the yard. Um, and underneath that, it went straight down to natural geology. So it seems that the mills was, was the first was the first building in that area. And actually, there was an earlier activity um, before the mill came along. Um, I don't know quite how bulky that area was. Um, the mill is there for a reason next to water, so I might explain why no one was here before. Just want to say that none of this would be possible without the finds first being cleaned and sorted and marked uh, by a wonderful finds team who came along not only for the weekend but for quite a few sessions afterwards. Um, and without their help, it wouldn't be impossible to actually to date and identify everything that we have found. <coughs> this is, I just want to highlight that actually, digs don't stop when the test pits are finished at the end of the weekend, there's quite a bit of work afterwards too. So I just want to put all of the test pits together now and have a bit of a look at the picture that's starting to emerge. So running kind of through time, from the 12th to the 14th century, this is where we see medieval finds. So the larger the black dots, the more, more finds we found of that date. So you can see that there's quite a tight cluster of activity up at the top of that uh, Draco Lane and Blakeswell Lane meeting. Quite clear evidence of medieval activity going on up there, and a little bit down at Wolverley Court too. In the 15th and 16th centuries, that cluster seems to get a little bit bigger, uh, but it doesn't change drastically. And in the 17th and the 18th centuries, it really is quite an expansion and explosion of the finds that we see across the village. So we wanted to answer some questions by doing a big dig. And the first one of those was, where was the medieval village? I think from the pictures we've just been looking at, we can fairly definitively say that there was a cluster of medieval settlements up kind of on the brow of the hill to go up Blakes or Lane. It seems that actually there were probably some quite important, certainly very substantial buildings up there too, uh, which may help us in answering the question of where was the medieval manor. We may well have been up there, 
So that is a slightly harder question to answer. Um, just because there was medieval uh, settlement up there doesn't necessarily mean the manor was there. Could be somewhere we haven't seen, but there certainly were, were people living up there in medieval times. What we see though from Wolverley Court is that it wasn't the only area where people were living. And we know from historic records there are other places in the parish that are mentioned in quite early records, so Cookley comes up quite early on. And actually across the parish of Wolverley, there was probably a scatter of small settlements going on. And the cluster um, by Draco Lane Corner may well have been a sort of bigger area of settlements, um, but it may not have been the only one. Now this is something that we do quite often see in quite wooded areas and in the medieval period Wolverley probably was fairly wooded, at least relative to other parts of Worcestershire. The big dig that we ran in Beerley, just north of Redditch, had a similar story and similarly was quite a wooded area in that they had lots of little clusters of settlement rather than one sort of one concentrated village. What we didn't see in Bailey though was we didn't see sort of one bigger cluster. They were all just very tiny little sort of dots of, of activity. So actually Wolverley's story is a little bit different. Perhaps is slightly bigger focus of activity, slightly more important area. Um, <coughs> but certainly it wasn't uh, one, one large village. Another kind of important thing to, to bear in mind is that there does seem to have been a medieval church here because in 1086 there's a record of a priest being here and the priest presumably was attached to a church. It's quite likely that the church uh, is where the current church is today and it's just underneath that. It could well be that there was medieval activity and, and some houses around the church and there certainly is mention later on of Burry Hall having a court there in the later medieval period. We didn't find, though, any medieval activity at Test Pits um, 11 and 12, so at Rose Cottage and Panshot Cottage. There, wasn't, there, was, there was no medieval property there. And I think if the church had quite a substantial uh, settlement, quite a lot of houses around it, we would have seen something in those Test Pits. This is not to say that the church was totally isolated and on its own, but if it did have houses around it, it probably weren't that many. I mentioned at the beginning that Wolverley is known from historical records from the 9th century onwards. And that begs the question, where were people living between the 9th century and the 12th, 13th century, which is some of the earliest pottery that we've found so far? The answer to that question seems to be that we can't see these settlements in Worcestershire. So this is not something unique to Wolverley. This is something that we are seeing across all six of the big digs that we've run. Is actually that in Worcestershire, in villages, people are either not people are not using pottery because they're choosing not to or because they don't have access to it until about 1250 AD. So up to that point, people are using pottery in burials. Quite often see it. In towns, we see it a little bit, but it is vanishingly rare to find pottery from the 9th, 10th centuries in Worcestershire. It's actually so rare, some of our finds archaeologists are um, always want triple checking when they find some because it only comes up about every decade. This is actually quite an interesting uh, story that is telling us because in East Anglia, they have been able to see the very early formation of villages because people are using pottery over there. And actually, in Worcestershire, we seem to have something different going on. And I suspect that there is perhaps a cultural shift in how people want to use pottery, what they're wanting to use it for, between that very early medieval period and then a little bit after the Norman Conquest. Suddenly, people are very happy to have ceramic cooking pots um, and they become available to them. Whereas before that date, that's just not an option that either it's either not an option that's there or not an option people are going for. So, quite uh, an interesting uh, story that that's bringing up.
On a pottery note as well, um, it's also interesting in Wolverley that there's pottery from so many different places that are found here, so many pottery is it. Um, but interestingly, you have some quite locally made pottery. So it's not just this very unusual shape pot from Plastic Six, but quite a few of the other pieces, our finds archaeologists didn't recognise the source of and um, doesn't know for certain where it comes from. There hasn't been that much research in North Worcestershire as to where, where is making pottery. But what it seems is that there's probably quite a lot of different local potters. But up in North Worcestershire, we see them all as individual potters, even if they're working quite close to each other, because the geology changes quite a lot here. Around Worcester and around Malvern, there are potters working there who were probably one or two per village, spread out over an area. But the geology is really similar. So neighbouring villages, villages a few miles apart, their geology looks the same. And so we see them just as Worcestershire pottery or Malvern pottery. Up here, it seems perhaps we see them all as kind of individual potters because the clay composition is different. There's been some quite unusual pottery found here that uh, appears to have bits of coal in it. It's quite an unusual thing to see. And I presume it seems to come from geology that is both near coal measures, but also that has some igneous rock in it as well, because that's part of the clay. And that's really quite an unusual combination to find. And the nearest source to here that has that combination somewhere called the Stone Clee, which is about 30 kilometres to the west. So this is an area of future research. It's not something we've got all the answers to now, but it's an area actually that could probably be quite fruitful to explore of actually where were the medieval potters in North Worcestershire and where were they all operating? Because it might be possible to tie some of them down kind of a little bit more precisely than we see elsewhere. <coughs> And lastly, from moving on to the medieval period, the village after that point uh, may have grown a little tiny bit in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, it's hard to say, it doesn't, certainly doesn't grow in masses, um, and but equally though, it doesn't seem to shrink lots. So it's hard to say for definite uh, what impact the crises during the 14th century, so the Black Death, and there was a plague as well, and several other natural disasters. Hard to see what impact they had here, but certainly by a century or so later, the village certainly doesn't seem to be suffering too much as a result. There then seems to be quite a big expansion in the 17th and the 18th centuries. And this isn't just that people were owning more stuff, because at this stage people did start owning more things, it became a bit cheaper. We actually see quite a lot of areas in the village that are being lived on for the first time. So people are, are building in places that hadn't been built in before. Probably at this stage that the village starts to look as it did in the Victorian era, and kind of in a the road coming down um, to the outcrop by the church. And some of this may well be linked to the canal arriving in the 1770s and the mills being built in the area. So that was a little bit of a whirlwind trip around some of the thousand years of Wobbly's history. If you do want to know more, the report will be finished in the next couple of weeks and will be shared online. And we'll email out the link as well to everyone who's taking part. So if you want to have a look uh, at that and find out more, do keep an eye out. There's also an exhibition that's currently up, uh, which combines all six of the test pit areas together and looks at kind of the overall story. So that's currently up in Kidderminster Library until the 9th of February, and then it's moving on to Redditch Library and to the High of Worcester. Um, so if you're interested in that, do go and have a look. This is a sneak peek of it, so it's, um, it's the archaeological finds combined with some artwork, and it's been inspired by the finds too. And the last thing I want to say is a massive thank you to everyone who took part in the project in some way. So whether you hosted a test pit, you came and dug for the weekends, you helped with fines, or you helped in any other way, this wouldn't have happened and these stories wouldn't have come to light without your help. <laughs>
So thank you very much for making all of that possible. And I want to say as well a special thank you to Wolverley and Cookley Historical Society, and particularly to Janet, for everything you've done along the way to support this. Um, and as well to David Collier, uh, who has overseen the fines processing. Um, so without everyone else's help, it's just one that happens. And I'm going to leave you now on uh, this lovely picture drawn by Rob Hedge, our fine archaeologist, which summarises the earliest settlement activity seen in each chest pit and a selection of the most interesting finds as well. So feel free to have a look at that. There's a copy at the back as well with the finds displayed. Um, and feel free to ask some questions. I'll turn off the recording so you can ask them.